Haley on the stage is Jim Fitterling. Jim is the Chief Executive Officer of Dow, a global material science company. Welcome, Jim. Next is Chairman, Co-Chief Executive Officer and Founder of Salesforce and a pioneer of cloud computing, Mark Benioff. And please uh, welcome back Jim Fish, our President and Chief Executive Officer of Waste Management. Kelly, take it away. Hello again. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. This is going to be a really exciting conversation. I have to say, I've been thinking a lot about this. And one of the things that gets me most excited for this conversation is the fact that we're talking to three Fortune 500 CEOs coming from completely different industries. And yet, you still come to the stage facing a lot of the same challenges, um, even within the different industries that you're in. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is the fact that arguably your job today as CEO is more complex than it has ever been before. I don't know that I'm trying to elicit sympathy <laughs> so much as kind of point out the fact that when we talk about the roles that you all are playing today, not simply for your company or your employees or your community, but really on the global stage, it's much more complex than probably we had envisioned even 10 years ago. So I thought we might start with that, with the role of the CEO and how it's evolved. Um, there's been a little bit of talk this morning, certainly Secretary Kerry mentioned it. You mentioned it earlier, Larry Fink had sent a new note again um, this year in his letter talking about the call for CEOs to play a greater role in society. Last Last August, the business roundtable comprised of 200 CEOs announced the purpose of a corporation is no longer about shareholder value, but now about stakeholder value. And that companies have an obligation to deliver for employees, customers, shareholders, and the environment. So I thought maybe we'd start with that. Jim and Mark, you're both members of the business roundtable. I want to start by asking you, how important is this declaration? Well, I think it was um, timely that, it, that we came to it. I think it had been building up for quite a while. And I thought the response from people that we're putting stakeholders in front of shareholders was a little bit interesting because our discussions had always been around this is an and. You have to do both. You have to make money and you have to take care of your employees mm -hmm. and, the, and the environment. And, and address some of the other issues that aren't being addressed by governments. And I think one of the things we felt is business leaders have to step in and fill that void. And, and maybe, as Secretary Kerry said, governments aren't being very good right now at infrastructure projects and other things, and they can't solve these problems alone. They need leadership to do it, and we're good allocators of capital. Right. Mark, does it have the ability to create measurable impact? Well, Jim and I were just in uh, the World Economic Forum in uh, Davos, uh, Switzerland, where really for the last 50 years we've been hearing about Klaus Schwab, the founder there, say that we do need a new capitalism, a stakeholder capitalism. And I think that if you were in Davos last week, you would come away thinking that capitalism is indeed dead because a new capitalism is emerging with these top chief executives, and that new capitalism is a stakeholder capitalism. Mm -hmm. and if I could explain that, you know, when I went to business school, it was all about shareholder return. Right. Milton Friedman, the business of business is business. And that just doesn't work today uh, in a society and in a world where we're going through very much a planetary emergency. So you can see that, and, and let me say that on the shareholder side, Salesforce has, and our shareholders, shareholders have done just fine. We've had about a 4,000% return since we went public in 2004. Um, but we've also had a dramatic stakeholder return as well. That is, we look at our key stakeholders in our, in our business. Um, let me give you a couple of examples. One is when um, uh, a law was passed in Indiana discriminating against our LGBTQ employees, we took action with other companies to get that law changed. Mm -hmm. the, the reason why is because LGBTQ employees, thank you, are key stakeholders, right. for example. Right. Uh, another example is for our female employees, mm -hmm. or a key, key stakeholder yeah. for us, we now pay men and women equally for equal work. Yes. So that means that, that, that means that 
you know, we're auditing every year mm -hmm. and have improved uh, the pay of our female employees by $10 million because we get these inequalities. And it keeps happening because we're an acquisitive company. We've done 50 or 60 acquisitions. When you buy a company, you not only get their intellectual property, right. you get their culture, you also That's get true. their pay scales. So we have to then adjust that because in some cases, they're not treating people fairly or equally. And, and, a, and a third example is the, the planet is a key stakeholder, which was why I was so excited to come when I got the invitation from Jim, because this very much aligns with that vision we have, that we have to look at the planet as a stakeholder. We're in a planetary emergency at many levels. I know we're gonna talk about that today. But for example, we're a net zero company. Soon we'll be a fully renewable company. Yep. We launched at Davos that we're planting 100 million trees uh, in terms of a carbon sequest further carbon sequestration for the planet. We also aligned with the uh, program announced by the White House in Davos, which is one trillion trees on the planet that's getting mapped out yep. to sequester 200 gigatons of carbon because the planet is also a key stakeholder. So yes, we have to manage shareholder returns, mm -hmm. but yes, we have to manage stakeholder returns. And the modern CEO, like the three that are up here today, that is how we think today. That is not where we were, I would say, 20 years ago, for example. That's right, or I would argue that is how you have to think today, but maybe not every CEO is thinking that way today. Clearly, the three of you are. You wouldn't be on stage here. Jim, I want to jump to you for a second because you convened this conversation. And as Mark just touched on, you know, it's necessary if you want to make an impact to bring others into the fold. And so one of the things that you've done is brought together two other CEOs who are interested in continuing to have positive impact. Um, how do you think about convening conversations and convening people across industries to to have a measurable impact, in particular when you're in um, somewhat of a specific industry yourself. Well, we are in a kind of a specific area uh, on the supply chain, and as as is Jim, for example. Yeah. And so I hadn't met either of these two gentlemen until about a year ago. I met Jim in New York, and and we talked about sustainability, how important it was to both of our companies. So it felt like a natural to invite Jim, and then and then I met Mark uh, a couple of months ago in Houston, and I thought, gosh, he's such a huge thinker. Mm. How about having him here to really talk about these issues? I mean, he, he, he went through this conversation about trees with us, which I honestly ha wasn't aware of. I mean, it's, it's actually kind of shameful that I wasn't aware of it, but, but um, I, I do think that putting together this forum with some, some great thinkers on it uh, is, is fantastic. It's a fantastic first step. It's a small example of what we can all do, but it has to go way, way, way beyond just this conversation. Mm -hmm. So the conversation is good, and it starts people thinking, but then we all have to take away from this and actually take active steps, take steps to do something. It's why we're taking active steps with our fleet. Right. Uh, I, you know, we, we can, uh, Secretary Kerry talked about, um, you know, what do you think about electrification or hydrogen? And I said, look, we can turn on a dime with our fleet, literally. And we've, we've essentially turned on a dime going from diesel to natural gas. And we can turn on a dime again uh, when, the, when the technology uh, works for us, and we think it is moving along quickly. So the, the fact is that, that bringing these two gentlemen up here to, to have this conversation is a very important part of this forum, but I think it makes, uh, you know, the, it, it, all it does is, is kind of stimulate thought. Then we all have to leave and go take an active role in Right. managing our environment. Right, absolutely. And I think I think we'll come to that certainly over the course of this conversation. You mentioned trees, you mentioned trees. So let's start with trees. We all are familiar <coughs> with, with trees. And of course, I think this is a really interesting commonality given the varying sectors between you. I'm going to throw some numbers out here. Waste management is the largest recycler in North America. You recycle over 8.5 million tons of paper per year, which is the equivalent of saving 195 million trees. Um, you, Mark, talked about Good. your initiative with one trillion trees. And at Dow, Jim, you're also committed to reforestation, helping to plant trees, too. So let's talk about the importance of that. Maybe, Mark, you want start to start us off with why you jumped into that initiative and, and why Salesforce has a stake in this game. Well, last uh, April, a uh, researcher in Zurich, Switzerland, did something really unusual. He took artificial intelligence, something we do a lot with at Salesforce, and also new next generation low hanging satellites, which are very high definition, and combined them for the first time to map out um, what it would take to build a network of trees 
that would sequester a huge amount of carbon. The, the way to think about the problem is that since 1750, the first industrial revolution, we've basically put about 280 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere. And that 280 gigatons of carbon is out there. There's only a few ways for that carbon to get sequestered. You have the oceans, they do about 40,000 gigatons of carbon. You've got soils and next generation regenerative soil techniques, it's about 3,000 <coughs> gigatons of carbon. And then you have the trees. And the trees do about two, I think it's about 200 gigatons per two trillion trees, per one trillion trees. So we've deforested the planet from, we used to have six trillion trees, we now have three trillion trees. That means we've taken about 600 gigatons of sequestration capacity right off the planet. So that's why either A, it's in the atmosphere, or B, it's in the oceans, and or, in the, or it's going into the soils, but we need more sequestration capacity. We have to do two things mm -hmm. with the planet. One is we have to reduce car emissions. You've heard about that today. Christiana Figueres with the Paris Accord, John Kerry, the imperative that every company has to become net zero, every person. How many companies here, by the way, are already net zero companies? Can you raise your hand if you're a net zero company? So I think that that is gonna be a big shift, yep. that every company will identify how they can become a net zero carbon emitter. So they can look at their carbon footprint, we've done it, it's very straightforward, we publish our stakeholder report on how to do it, but say, you know what, we're not adding more carbon in the atmosphere, number one. Then, number two, there's a lot out there, how are we gonna bring it down? That's why I was so excited last week that President Trump at the World Economic Forum announced that he aligned uh, with other global leaders to um, create a program called 1T.org. Mm -hmm. 1T.org is to plant one trillion trees planted throughout the planet as mapped out by this researcher, Tom Crowther. And the Chinese government also is participating, the European government, the Colombian government, others, a thousand companies all started to come in because that also gives them the ability to become more of a net zero company because planting <coughs> trees is a key way to sequester carbon. Perhaps it's the, well, the tree is the most efficient way, most efficient technology that scales. Jim might have other ones, or Jim might have other ones that, but the tree, yep. by the way, the tree is a bipartisan issue, so that was exciting. That's right, that's right. I figured, yeah, one of the few, I, one of the few that we I figured found. I figured I'd yeah. start off with, with the softball. Who knew? And right. also, who's anti-tree? That's right. Nobody's right. anti-tree. We're all pro-tree. <laughs> it's a uniter, actually. That's right. Jim, yeah. tell us a little bit about your efforts here. Yeah, so we, we do a lot of reforestation around our, our facilities, obviously to do two things. One, it, it gives us a green belt around the facilities, and, and that's helpful. But it also gives us a natural way to deal with things. So beyond reforestation, we also do things like natural wastewater treatment. Instead of building a wastewater treatment facility, we'll use uh, a man-made wetlands, and we'll use plant materials to recycle water in our facilities. Um, and we've been working for more than a decade with the Nature Conservancy, which is one of the leading NGOs in this space. So when science-based uh, targets and initiatives came out, you know, we looked at what could trees do to help us offset our CO2 footprint, because we're a big energy-intensive company. We can't do it with trees alone. Yep. We can offset some of the emissions, but we have to go back to source reduction as well. And I, I agree with where Secretary Kerry was that for us, everything comes back to an energy policy. So we can have a good environmental policy, but we gotta have a good energy policy that matches up with it. And in our case, fossil fuels, at least natural gas, has helped us move in that direction. If you look at our industry, we moved away from using coal as fire for power plants in our industry almost 30 years ago because we were challenged with emissions reductions. If you look at what's happened in the United States today, we've had a huge reduction in emissions because we've moved away from coal to natural gas. Natural gas was meant to be a bridge fuel mm -hmm. to a future economy, but some of the things that we need to make for batteries, for uh, photovoltaic solar systems, are energy intensive materials right. as well. So we've got to come up with solutions that make sense and policies that make sense. And I think that's where the companies can play a leading example so we can show yeah 
You know, from 2006 to 2019, we've grown our business dramatically, but we've reduced CO2 right. by 20%. Right. And it wasn't all done with trees. It was done with technology and innovation. That's what you're talking about doing right. with your fleet. We've got to do both. And, and we've got the ability, companies have the ability to scale technology, mm -hmm. to deploy capital. We can empower our employees to be part of that solution. Yep. Part of that empowerment is giving them the data that they need. So 40% of CO2 emissions comes from heating and air conditioning buildings. Mm -hmm. If we gave every employee the data that they needed to know in their building and facility what they could do to reduce CO2 emissions, right. we'd have a huge impact. So you're touching on responsibility there, and I think that's a good place to come back to you, Jim, because um, as leaders, of course, we all have responsibilities um, that, that really do have the ability to make an impact. And I talked to Secretary Kerry earlier about um, the fact that he thinks that really the private sector is going to push this. The private sector will be the one to make an impact more so than the government. But maybe you could talk a little bit about um, how you see your responsibility and what it's like working with the government to try to um, cover off on some of these issues and come to an agreement where you can drive impact, especially to use uh, Mark's term, you know, in a, in a partisan world or the opposite of what it's Mark. It's a really enjoyable right. experience working with the government. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, I, uh, you know, I would tell you, we, we mostly actually work with uh, state and local governments, mm -hmm. and state and local governments are 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 much easier to work with. I would That's tell right. you than than oftentimes the federal government, regardless of who's uh, of which party is in charge. It's just a bigger bureaucracy. So. But, um, but I would tell you that I, I totally agree with what Secretary Kerry said about businesses playing such an active role in solving this huge problem. Uh, I've always felt like the private sector is better at solving problems than, than government. Yep. Uh, and so uh, really tackling this from the private sector side, uh, that's why, and I haven't been to Davos. Mark had said, Jim, you gotta go to Davos. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think it's probably something I'll have to do next year. But, but it's really, it sounds like, such an active discussion. Yes. And so certainly uh, government is involved, but I think the private sector will ultimately help us uh, see the error of our ways in the past. I also, it's part of why we focused on the, the generational differences. Mm -hmm. And it's part of why, why I had, uh, you know, our, our two girls up here. They do think differently. They right. think differently than, than we did. They think differently than, than my dad's generation did. So the millennials and the Gen Zs are helping us take a different, a different role, uh, you know, and, and, and act a bit more responsibly when it comes to the environment. And then we as business leaders, by the way, we'll only be business leaders for, for so much longer. And then that group takes over. Right. So Peter Zine talked about how, you know, oh geez, they're gonna, but you know what, I'm actually pretty excited about when, when they take over because they are thinking differently about, about these big major macro problems that the world faces. That's right, and, and there are no shortage of them. Um, trees, a bipartisan issue. Let's go to somewhat of a partisan issue, if you will, although we're not gonna talk politics so much, <coughs> but I do wanna talk about plastics because it's mm -hmm. not all positive. Um, Jim, I think you, your, your company's in a unique position, certainly on stage, um, or has unique challenges with respect to plastics. Um, a lot of the talk around plastics, of course, is that consumers are changing their behavior, it's sort of what you see every day in a way that you hadn't even a year ago. Right? Governments and corporations are, are banning use in varying degrees. San Diego has banned styrofoam food and drink containers. Canada aims to ban single-use plastics by 2021. Peru, for those of you that don't know, will no longer allow people to carry single-use plastics into their 76 natural and cultural protected areas. Um, single-use, again, if you don't know, refers to plastic that's used only one time. <laughs> Uh, a, a surprising statistic that I read is 40% of all plastic is for packaging, which is used only once and then thrown away. Um, mm. Straw bands are everywhere. They seem to be popular. Companies like Disney, American Air, United, even Red Lobster are banning single-use straws. So, so talk a little bit about the unique challenges that you face um, as a company and how you think about one, the future of the products that you'll create, but two, also balancing the progress of your business while balancing or solving, helping to solve for some of the challenges we face in the environment. Right, I think, um, I think plastics obviously is at the center of this conversation because of the ocean plastic issue, uh, which is a travesty. But it goes back to uh, what Christiana was talking about earlier, is we have grown up and built a linear economy. Uh, we use everything once, we throw it away, we landfill it, that's, that's the end of it. We don't think about what happens at the end of life and how do we bring it back and recycle it and use it again. 
So our biggest challenge as an industry is we have to stop the waste and we have to close the loop on that economy. Um, and one of the things that we did as an industry about June of 2018, uh, five of the big players, Secretary Kerry named them all, um, and myself got together, and we had all agreed to the Paris Accord, and we're all driving environmental policies in our companies to meet that. We got together in one afternoon and said, we got to put together an alliance that works from the resin producers, the packaging converters, the consumer brand companies, the retailers, all the way down to the consumers and the waste management companies, and look at that entire value chain and how do you redesign it. Because if you're going to stop the waste, you've got to get down to consumer behavior. They, they need to be able to put it in a recycle bin and get it recycled, but then Jim's got to have some place to sell it, and you've got to have consumers that want that demand back. So I say in a positive way, um, internally with our team, the challenge in the plastics business is we design a lot of complex structure for packaging that you use every day, um, cereal packages, uh, food and dairy, meats, cheeses. Um, they need to be recycled. 100% of our product line should be able to be recycled. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you get it recycled? And how do you get people to want to buy post-consumer recycled material? For many years, brand owners did not want the material because they were more concerned about the aesthetics of the product than they were about the circularity. So now you have brand owners stepping up. Nestle recently stepped up and says, we will buy $2 billion of post-consumer recycled resin and put into our food packaging. That's huge because right. that means why we've got an outlet for that and that's gonna drive investment in recycle. Why would every company not step up and buy? They are. Um, Sealed Air just announced that bubble wrap, their ubiquitous bubble wrap that you get in, in packaging at home every day is gonna be made with post-consumer recycled content. Um, you've got Unilever with Dove and Axe brands that are coming out with right. recycled packaging. You've got Procter & Gamble, tons of examples out in the, yeah. in the lobby today. Yeah. Everybody's moving into that space, and you know what the consumers are saying, which they didn't say 10 years ago or 20 years ago is, I want that, right. and in some cases, I'm willing to pay more for that. Right because I know that I'm making a contribution. So it's partially an education issue, right? I mean, I'm out there, I see the new Tide bottles, and, and I would not have any idea what the difference is between the old bottle and the new bottle, if, for, except for the fact that it might cost a little more. I might wonder why, but if we were better educating, even obviously starting at a young age, um, the public and then corporations about this, um, people might feel better about it and be right. to spend on it. And, and you started on single-use plastics, and I'll, I'll go back and say, you know, not all of the things that we use that are single-use grocery bag is a good example. Um, it can be recycled, right. but it's not easy to recycle. And so people tend to use it. Maybe they use it again to pick up after the dog, and then they throw it away. But, you know, that's what happens with it. But typically when you go at this, if you go at it from a standpoint of I want to close the loop and I want to promote circularity, what you tend to drive is investment, new technology, and innovation. When you go at it from the standpoint of bans, you may actually do more harm to the environment than good. A great example, you ban a plastic bag, and you force somebody into a paper bag, that's four to five times as much CO2 emissions as the alternative. Or a canvas bag, which is great, but you gotta reuse that thing 20,000 times to make the same efficiency. So we got to make sure that we get policies right. And I like the way Christiana talked about it is, let's look at single use anything and figure out how we're going to stop the waste and close the loop. And, and we're all in on the plastic side of it for being part of that and, and creating a lot of projects to actually showcase that. And that's where I think industry plays the biggest role is we can put capital to work, we can showcase solutions, and then we can get the attention of governments mm -hmm. and say, how do I replicate this where you live? And I'm happy if it's state and local because I think the vast majority of these solutions are gonna be cities and municipalities That's right. tackling this issue, not federal governments. That's right, every year at Davos, uh, Edelman releases this uh, annual trust barometer to talk about um, how people are feeling, uh, where, where their trust lies within the world, and the big takeaway is that trust is local. So people feel really good about what they know and what's close to home. Um, what would you uh, add well, to what Jim just said? I, I just think it's, it's interesting that, because uh, a lot of this is generational. I mean, my parents' generation 
didn't really have single-use stuff, maybe short of like Christmas wrapping paper or something, and my mom still folded it up and reused it, so my presents were always <laughs> exactly. in like the same pr paper every year. But, um, but we didn't really have single-use things, and, and there wasn't any designed obsolescence for, uh, my dad and mom had the same washing machine for 25 years. Our LG washing machine will, will, is fantastic. I don't know how long it's gonna last, but it's not probably gonna last as long as their Sears right. washing machine. Your from, children will from not inherit your washing machine. That's right. Yeah, so I think this is somewhat of a, a, a development over really the last 20 years. Um, but I do think that finding alternative uses, it's not as if we're going to go backwards on this, but I do think that finding alternative uses, I mentioned a company called Continuous, and so we talk about things like mixed paper. And the market for mixed paper basically dried up a, a year and a half ago when China said, we're not going to take mixed paper anymore. So we can either sit in our conference rooms in Houston and say, well, gosh, I mean, boo-hoo, I mean, we don't have a market now for mixed paper, and, and, or we can figure out an alternative use for it. So that's why I, I highlighted Continuous today, because Continuous is, is a company that takes mixed paper and, and low-value plastics, like those, those uh, grocery bags, and turns them into something that's productive. It turns it into a building material that is, is stronger than, than the current building material, and obviously it's more sustainable. Right. So I think part of the answer is, is an innovation answer. It's, it's, it's not necessarily going to be going back to where my parents were or where their parents were, because there's a huge amount of value in plastics. There really is. I mean, there's so many things that are made out of plastic. But I do think finding alternative uses, if it doesn't go through our recycle uh, facility and come out the back end as another, as another uh, you know, water bottle or another soda bottle, then maybe there's an alternative use for it, and that's why we highlighted uh, this company today. And, and to Jim's point, I think in terms of the thinking of the people and the, and the employees in the organization, so it would be easy for us to go just build more of the same capacity that we've built for the last 40 years to make plastics, but now we're starting to look at each other and say, whoa, um, we're going to need more post-consumer recycled material, we're going to need more blends for customers, we're going to need to find sources out of facilities like yours that we can take back in through either chemical recycling all the way back to feedstock, in which case that's one less well you've got to drill, right. or mechanical recycling back into another product. And that drives a different way of thinking. And, and then suddenly, without really thinking too much about it, you've redeployed your capital into a future investment that's a lot different than the old investment. And the same on energy. If we, if we set as, and we will be a carbon neutral company, the only debate we're having internally is what year we declare we're going to be carbon neutral. But we can do it because we've showed ourselves that we can grow and still reduce CO2 emissions. Right. And technologies are coming that may even allow us beyond trees to scrub some of this back out of the air. <laughs> now we've got to find uses for that. CO2 and what do we do with it? How do we make product out of it? Right. You touched on the fact that plastics um, is a large part of the conversation because of ocean plastics. And Mark, I know you um, have a personal connection to oceans that has kind of driven your thinking around helping to um, clean up the ocean. So maybe talk a little bit about um, why you're so passionate about helping to clean up the oceans and where you see progress being made or not being made in that respect. Well, part of this planetary emergency that we're in right now is around the oceans. We um, look at the health of the oceans and there's two major issues in the oceans. One, of course, is acidification. The ocean is getting much hotter all of a sudden. And the reason why is because it's trying to sequester that carbon that's in the atmosphere, that basically that 280 gigatons of carbon that should not be there. And that's kind of the premise of why we need the trillion trees. The second major issue in the oceans is that, according to the World Economic Forum that we were just in last week, in Davos, by 2050, only less than 30 years from now, we'll have more plastic in the ocean than fish. Well, who wants a plastic ocean? You know, that is not something that any of us are going to tolerate. Mm -hmm. And we've got to stop that now. And if you look at the issue of how that plastic is getting into the ocean, there are 10 major rivers in the world that are basically the source of dumping of the plastics that we're talking about into the ocean. So what we've done is we've talked about multi-stakeholder dialogues and multi-stakeholder action. We've united governments, foundations, uh, major educational universities, entrepreneurs, 
and we have called for RFPs um, through our Benioff Ocean Initiative to start to deploy very advanced river cleaning machines in these 10 core rivers. We've deployed, or about to deploy, the first one through a partnership with the Coca-Cola Foundation in Panama. In fact, when we called for RFPs on this, we got over 100 RFPs from the major governments who all realize that they're dumping this plastic and they want to stop it, but they also want to get paid to stop it. So we have to fund it, we have to buy the machines, we have to deploy the machines, we have to maintain the machines, and, uh, but we got to get the plastic out of the ocean. That, that's the number one thing, and one of the key ways is this exactly what you said, source reduction. There's also been other, other entrepreneurs who have deployed devices into the middle of the ocean to kind of grab plastic out of the, the, the great ocean plastic uh, patch that's out there. Um, but this is something that should be on all of our minds in terms of the health of the ocean. It's not just about conservation and protection, which is extremely important. It's not just about acidification and the temperatures of the ocean, but we have to find ways to get this plastic out of the ocean. Yeah. Well, and Mark, it's so much more cost effective and efficient to do it at the rivers, right, than to do it in the ocean. I mean, if you're in 40 foot seas trying to, mm -hmm. trying to collect plastics, which I think a lot of it ultimately breaks down and, and, and sinks, right? But in the rivers, I mean, that's where, if, that's, if there's 12 rivers or whatever that are sourced, it's so much more cost effective to do it in the rivers and so much more efficient. You collect a lot more of it coming out of the rivers than trying to go out in the middle of the great Pacific garbage patch. And when we talked about the, the value chain alliance that we put together, you know, we quickly raised one and a half billion dollars to go address this. And we're gonna showcase technologies and ways to do this. But the reason we focused on these 10 countries and 10 rivers in, in Asia primarily was because as our quality of life grew in Europe and in, West, and, in North America, we built infrastructure, so we have great infrastructure. Now, we, I would argue that long term, we want, don't want all this material to go to landfill either. We want to recycle it and find other uses. Yep. But we have infrastructure to manage 96, 97% of all the solid waste that we generate gets well managed here. If you go to those countries, 75% of all their solid waste goes to an open dump. And a lot of it is within 100 meters of a beach. So when weather happens, it all washes out to the ocean. The, the growth of the middle income populations in places like Thailand, Vietnam, um, even in India, has been so fast that the infrastructure hadn't been able to keep up. So what we're doing in both cases, whether it's clean up or whether it's build that infrastructure, we're really kind of going in and showing governments, here's a solution, here's what it takes, here's how to put a business model in place, and for some of us, that's an opportunity for business there, but it's also a way to get them to address the issue and, and make sure that we don't add to a problem. And so that this prognostication that there will be more plastics than fish in the ocean by 2050 doesn't come true. If we act, that won't be the case. Right. Um, I think it's good that we can all sit here and have this conversation. One of the things that I talked about with Secretary Kerry earlier is that it's hard to visualize change. Um, but you, you had your two daughters up here earlier, Jim. I often think about um, the future through the lens of my children. Their school has this thing called No Waste Wednesday, where every Wednesday you can only bring things that are meant to be brought back home. We can't throw anything out. And I think when that starts at a really young age, they start to develop really good habits naturally. And ultimately, they will be the change that we are aiming to see. Um, but as we think about building that change for them now, and all the things we're discussing are not necessarily things that they see, mm. what are the things that we can be doing, perhaps with our local communities, to demonstrate for, for our children or for others within the community the action that they can take and showing them that it does make a difference today and not just for the future. 2050, that feels far, especially for a child. 30 years from now, they can't envision that. But what are the things that, as corporations, we can be doing and talking about um, within well, local I, I communities? Think, I mean, Secretary Kerry talked about this. Uh, I talked about it a bit in, in my remarks, and that is that education, whether it is education at my daughter's level or whether it's education, uh, honestly, sometimes at our level, we need more education than they do. They seem to understand it better than I do. but. But I think education is, is such a critical component. I think that's why Secretary Kerry focused on it. Yep. Um, and once people understand the problem, I think part of the, part of the problem around 
climate change has been that people haven't really fully understood the problem. Right. And so once we understand the problem, I mean, uh, case in point would be the fact that when, when Mark came and we first met and he talked about the trees issue, I, I didn't realize that. And it makes such perfect sense that trees, I mean, they, they use carbon. That's their, that's their oxygen, if you will. And the fact that we've cut down half the world's trees in, what, 200 years, something like that? I mean, it's, um, and gone from six trillion to, to three trillion. Uh, honestly, as he said, that there's nobody that's anti-tree, <laughs> but, um, but there just was a, a, you know, kind of a lack of education, even at my part. And I, look, I'm a, a, you know, a CEO of a big company. So um, I think the education component is the most important piece. And then once the education is in place, right. then it's much easier for our kids or for us to take an active role in fixing the problem. So you, do you, does that mean you work with local municipalities we to do. help put, put things out there that people couldn't read and help them understand and things like that? Yeah, we do. I mean, we have a campaign called Recycle Off and Re Recycle Right. And, and so we absolutely work with, right. with our local community partners, yep. with the companies that we do business with. And, and then, of course, it, it expands beyond just our business. It expands right. to our personal lives, That's which right. may, in fact, be the, the, the bigger the bigger issue altogether. Right. Employees also a huge thing to think about. You're all uh, heading up companies with, with thousands and thousands of employees and the ability to make a big impact. Um, I was telling Mark earlier that somebody had referenced the fact that Salesforce is a great place for young people mm -hmm. to come work and they want to work. And I think that's mm -hmm. in large part because of your leadership and you being vocal about helping to move the world forward and making progress on really significant issues. How do you think about um, educating your employees on these issues and, and helping them believe in the things that, that you believe in. Mm -hmm. Well, our employees have families and children just like all of we do, and I think that they realize that we're stealing our future from our children. You know, we've had clean oceans to sail on, and we've had clean air, but when you look at what just happened in Australia, where you saw, you know, basically 10 million acres or approximately a billion trees, a billion animals killed, in these horrible fires. Um, when you saw in California, two million acres or 200 million trees. In Bolivia, three million acres, 300 million trees. Or in, everybody saw the Amazon on fire in 2019, that's two million acres. That's where we're going. So what are we gonna say, wait a minute, we need to stop. That's why I was very proud you know, of what uh, Time Magazine did. Full disclosure, I own Time Magazine, but we put, <laughs> Greta Thurman, you know, Greta Thunberg <clears throat> on the cover of Time Magazine as Person of the Year because here's this amazing woman, 16 years old, she, uh, Swedish, you know, basically being a spokesperson saying, hey, you're taking my future from me. And I was very proud, you know, of the Time team for making that decision to put her on the cover and to make her Person of the Year because I think that we are at a moment in time when we can make changes, you know, that sequester the carbon. We can become net zero. We can stop the plastic from going into the oceans. We can build this type of plastic that's, you know, uh, uh, able to be recycled and, and so forth. So these are actions that we can take. We understand this is getting super serious. And uh, we don't really have that much more time. Everybody has, you know, you can kind of see what's happening. And, um, and uh, that, you know, that's why I was excited that our own government last week was willing yeah, to take such aggressive was. action. I was like, this is great, and that they were bringing the other governments in. They're saying that they're gonna link aid to other governments, that they better start planting trees also to uh, get aligned with this. I think that's a tremendous step forward. I think, I think um, the sustainability platform is what your, your population, whether they're young or old, wants to work on. And you have to get out of the way and empower them to come in and change the way that you do business. Um, the financial markets are well developed, right? So they're going to reward us on financial return or not. And those mechanisms are very strong. But the ESG mechanisms are not very strong. And we're building those out now. So we've got to use this opportunity. And data is a big source of it to get data in people's hands and empower them and to allow them to work on the innovations that 10 years from now are gonna be the leading innovations in the industry. That's very empowering. They'll wanna work there and then they wanna bring their friends in to work there. It's also what our customers demand. I, I would say almost 80% of everything we do today 
has a sustainability aspect to it because one of our customers or somebody in the value chain is trying to solve a problem and we gotta help them create the next generation of materials. And just like in data, you know, data scientists have become like this growing skill that we don't have enough of. Life cycle analysis is the same in our industry. We don't have enough people that really truly understand the life cycle analysis and the impact of all the decisions and trade-offs that they make. Um, so Mark, you know, gave a good example with the trees on what the, the life cycle is and what that does. When you get into selection and deselection of materials and you think you're moving in the right direction, sometimes you're not. We also have to design our future energy, whether it's solar or wind or batteries for cars or our energy grids, so that at the end of life with that waste, we know what we're gonna do with that because that could be an even bigger problem than the plastic waste issue. Right. We've covered a lot of ground so far, I think, and just before we go, um, a lot of people in the audience here are small business owners. And while it's great to hear you three who are large business uh, heads talk about the things that you're doing, the impact you have, we know that it's not easy on business per se to make the changes that are necessary ultimately to see the impact that you need. Um, could you give our audience some advice if they had a small business on steps they could take or ways in which they could, um, let's say, have less fear about the potential negative impact on their business return today uh, that could ultimately help the environment? Mm -hmm. Anyone want to take it? Jim, you want to start? I would, I would say when we, when we spun out Dow last year as kind of the new Dow, our tagline was Seek Together. Um, and we put it out there for a reason. It wasn't because we thought we had every answer to everything, but we have the capabilities to work with small business owners to come up with solutions. You don't have to do it alone. You can find alliances like the one we created on the Plastic Waste Alliance. Um, you can find uh, technology innovation partners that will work with you to help you solve a problem. And sometimes just the power of two or three of you getting together opens your eyes to something you didn't even know existed. So don't, even if you're a small company, don't hesitate to reach out to a large company to maybe partner on a project. We're gonna have to all work together to solve this. And um, we can also bring, the big companies can also maybe even bring uh, local governments into the equation because they may be part of the source of the recyclable material we need for the future. That's good advice, seek together. Mark, how about you? Well, one of the reasons that I wrote the book Trailblazer is because I felt executives need more direct advice. Yep. When I went to business school, all the topics that we just went through were not talked about. In many business schools, they're still not. Topics like sustainability and equality, this is not the business school narrative today. So um, we need more education, number one. Number two is when we started Salesforce 21 years ago, we put 1% of our equity all of our product and our time into a foundation. It was very easy because we had no equity, we had no time, we had no people, <laughs> product. But we do have 50,000 people today. We have a $160 billion market cap. Uh, we'll do, you know, um, 21 billion in revenue in the next fiscal year. And, you know, when I look out at that, because we did that, we've been able to give away more than 300 million in grants. We run 40,000 nonprofits and NGOs. For free on our service, we've done four and a half million hours of volunteerism. And that type of work, that is, business is the greatest platform for change. You can integrate your business into these issues and you can ignite your employees by making that decision. You know, like I said, um, every, every company is about shareholders and stakeholders. And you can make basic decisions like deciding to go net zero. You know, one of the crises we have here in our country is our public schools. I've adopted a public school. Every person I hope in this room has adopted a public school. They need our help. Salesforce has adopted. Every senior vice president is required to adopt a public school and, and lead the mentorship and ownership of that school. We've adopted 170 in two school districts. Those types of actions business can take. We don't just have to be about shareholder return. We don't have to just be about the business of business is business. Right. We can be transformational uh, forces on the planet at a time when we need it more than ever. This is a great opportunity 
for everybody to participate. This is why uh, this is why you have the ability to make such impact, which is great, Jim. I would say that that you know not only is this conversation not limited to uh, big companies, but actually it should be driven by honestly, if you think about the percentages within the United States, it should be driven by small business because small business is seventy percent of the workforce in the United States. So while it's very healthy that, that Jim Fitterling reached out to me, I'm not sure there's ever been a conversation between a CEO of Dow Chemical and a CEO of Waste Management prior to when we sat down. He, he called me or, or reached out to me uh, through his office and said, look, I'd like to sit down and talk about plastics and talk about sustainability next time you're in New York. And I made a, a pretty quick uh, response back saying, look, that's, I think that's a fantastic opportunity for two companies that don't normally, other than we, we probably have a customer relationship with them, but at the CEO level, we really haven't had much in the way of conversation. So I would say that small businesses can do the same thing. It doesn't have to be Dow Chemical and Waste Management. It can be small businesses having conversations with other small businesses that they might not normally talk to, to push forward this, uh, this, this dialect around this, these big, big macro issues. These big macro issues are not just gonna be solved by a big business. We've talked about the private sector, but the private sector is very, very much inclusive of small business. Yeah, really, really inspiring. And why don't we end on this note? Business is the greatest platform for change, as Mark said. Thank you all, you tremendous business leaders. And thank you for joining us. Thank you.